Welcome to Red Inca with Jared Kibber. This episode, we are going to talk about a bilateral game that normally wouldn't be that important, but in this particular case was very important when the India women uh, tied and then won against the Australian women. Uh, myself and Abara talked about this the other day, but to be fair, we didn't see that much of the actual cricket ourselves because uh, we weren't paid to cover it and we were just flicking around. Uh, I went to it because it was exciting at the end, let's be honest, which is how I follow most cricket. Um, but here we have um, Sarah Waris from India on 99.94, who was actually following the entire game. Let's start with this. 47,000 people. Uh, I saw something about free tickets. Explain to me uh, how the tickets worked and uh, why they worked and why there were so many people, please. So the first two, hi Jared, good to be here. <laughs> so the first two uh, matches of the series uh, were free. They were open for all. They were free, provided by the BCCI. Maybe the BCCI was like, you know, if we pr market the pri uh, tickets, if we have a price for them, no one is going to come and all that. Maybe they thought that, but actually so many people came and uh, 47,000 was the official record for the second T20I, which is huge considering it's women's cricket and considering that it was at the D.Y. Patil Stadium. D.Y. Patil Stadium hosts a lot of IPL matches. So it's not, you know, uh, it's not staffed for cricket. It's not staffed for high quality cricket. It's in Mumbai. And there are a lot of good matches which are held at the D.Y. Patil Stadium. So the fact that so many people turned up and went to see the women's I, uh, women's T20I willingly speaks a lot. And, you know, before the match began a few hours earlier, there was this poster on the gates which said stadium full ticket over. And for a second, I was just like, that That can't be happening. That can't be true. You know, so many people just can't be there watching a women's T20I. I was actually proven wrong. And there was actually 47,000 people at the stands cheering for the Indian women's team and it was I wish I was there a lot of my friends were there but uh, watching from TV it was just you know the overall atmosphere with chants of Vande Matram which is the slogan like loosely, loosely translated to come on India or uh, something of that sort so it was just yeah amazing to watch I mean it TV. looked absolutely heaving from what I could see it, it, it seemed like a brilliant brilliant uh uh, situation to be watching cricket in and you know the fact that they got so many people was just outstanding now I'm going to ask you for your historical take on this I know there is a game which is I think I always forget the year that this World Cup was um was played but there was a late 90s women's World Cup final 97 played, 97 yeah. yep it's good I knew it's not 96 and I feel like it's not 99 mm. because it's not in the men's years but it was somewhere around there good I'm um, close enough late 90s 97. Uh, there's a Women's World Cup final played in Eden Gardens where I don't think we have an official crowd, uh, but we have a semi-official crowd of anywhere between like 20,000 people and 90,000 people, depending on who you talk to. Let's put that aside because I don't think that was brilliantly counted. What What are some of the other more official highest um, crowds numbers that we've ever had in, for women's cricket in India? Before we get into that, the 1997 World Cup final, which you said at Eden Gardens, that was a very historical uh, match. You can say India didn't play the final, but that was a historical match for India because that was the match where Julian Goswami was, you know, one of the ball girls at the boundary ropes. And, you know, she saw the match and she was like, wow, I want to be there. I want to play the World Cup final. And that was, she is from Bengal, not from Calcutta, but from Bengal. And that was the match which, you know, she was inspired and she's like, I want to play cricket. So historical for Indian cricket that way also. And far as official records, um, ESPN Crick Info actually says that the Unofficial record for the that final was 80,000, but we don't have anything like official, so oh, we can't really put a number to it. But this was the highest. Uh, it, this was the highest uh, for a women's match official records. Uh, the previous best was 20,000, which was the first T20I. Before that was somewhere around 15,000, which was in 2000. 18, there was a match at Vadodara, I think, between India and South Africa, if I'm not wrong. 
uh so that was the previous best those tickets were priced it wasn't um free entry like this these ones so 18000 then was you know a huge number so it was uh, 15000 i think yeah 15000 was a huge number uh but 47000 is just stunning and um uh, there there's these you know there was a lot of talk about you know should the bcci have uh, ma- uh, priced the tickets you know they could have earned revenue from that possibly the bcci was like we are not going to earn anything from it or something and for the last 3 t20is actually the prices like the tickets are priced so you know the bcci is like okay wow this went beyond what we expected and now the tickets are priced for the last 3 t t20 is nominal fees per tier so uh, i mean i've long thought yeah. that there's a lot of cricket played around the world where the best ticket price would be free because you don't make a huge amount like you go to county cricket and you you get these crowds of like 1 to 2000 people paying 15 and 20 quid and you're just like what number would we get if it was free and you could come and go at any stage i've often thought that um around the world may, and maybe it wouldn't work but it's a really interesting um a social experiment let's talk about that particular game so australia make 187 for one uh, i would say if in a t20 game you only lose one wicket you've probably not gone mm-hmm. quite as hard as you should have um but that's a pretty big total um you know looking at uh, going up against the australian bowlers isn't it yeah definitely and uh, especially for india that kind of target 188 they are not really the best uh, chasing team uh, they often it's almost the openers if they do well then they do well and the, because they don't have a very strong they've not had a very strong middle order so the target of 188 was always going to be tough for them and uh, that's how you know i was also expecting it to go the similar route where india takes it close and then they just stumble because of the lack of a good middle order which changed and that was that i think was the positive for me from that match um they did they got a bit behind in that chase as well mm-hmm. lost some wickets um uh mandana was incredible she made what 70 odd in that innings smashing everything through the offside from the highlights that i saw They end up needing 14 runs from the last over, but it's against Megan Shute, who uh, I actually I haven't got the stat in front of me, but I'm going to say off the top of my head that her economy rate in T20 internationals is something like 6.26. Right, she's not unhittable, but fairly unhittable when it comes to T20 <laughs> cricket. 14 runs in that last over when you don't have your top order uh, batting is pr- quite tough, no matter what, right? Yeah, definitely it's tough, and especially the fact that uh, it was uh, Richa Ghosh out there. You know, she is a teenager. She is uh, she is playing the under nineteen World Cup, which has got a lot of criticism in its own way. That you know, if, if someone of that level who's played international cricket should go out and play under nineteen cricket, and Shufali Verma is in the team also. So uh, it's like you know, India is there to bully the other teams. So it was going to be tough, and then uh, actually, Dipti Sharma was on strike for the last uh, last over. Richa Ghosh ran a single, and Dipti Sharma was on strike for the last over, which was. Um, everyone's like you know that is the game of awareness which india still needs to develop because it went india's way they wake up where they came in and hit a four of the last ball to level the score and all but it could have well gone uh, south just because of the lack of game awareness because richa ghosh was batting so well she was ended with 26 of 13 but uh, you know they ran a single of the last second last uh, ball and then dipti sharma who wasn't really you know uh, who was new at the crease and is not the power hitter that you want her to be so um, it panned out well b- beautifully for india and 47000 people got their money's worth but uh, it's still you know these small small things which needs a little bit of improvement Well, also just the middle order. I, I I was a while back now, but I'm sure these stats still hold up. You were talking about how the Indian top order basically makes all the runs, and the Indian middle order ba- makes none. So chasing this total against Australia with your middle order, especially with you know teenager um, out in the middle who did some of the damage, there's some very good signs from Indian women's cricket. And for for you and I who've seen enough of them play, I you know at sometimes uh, well. 
it felt for a little while like they were essentially um, uh, getting their wicket keeper to get concussed on purpose so that they could replace her so they had more batting. I'm not yeah. saying they actually did that, but it did happen in a couple of games. But it did get to the point where you were thinking it's not the worst tactic in the world because they can't actually find enough players in the middle mm. order. This, I thought this was a really interesting team, a really interesting chase because of that fact. Yeah, and uh, Richard Ghosh, so the middle, uh, it was always Ma uh, Mandana, Varma, Gemma Rodriguez, who's not been in the best of forms for a long time, and then Harman Preet Kaur. And then the middle order was just, you know, made up of bowlers who could bat a bit, batters who could bowl a bit. It was, you know, you can say bits and pieces, middle order, or whatever word you can use for that. And the presence of Richard Ghosh, she bats at number five she, in the uh, in the second T20. She was a number five, but she can bat uh, anywhere down the lower middle order. She's batted at seven also, I think, if I'm not wrong. So uh, that just adds firepower to the team, which is something which they have lacked. It's... Uh, Harman Preet Kaur has her off days. She's blown hot and cold of late. Uh, and someone like Richa Ghosh, you know, she's so fearless. Even today, um, like after, during the third T20i, the stumps might caught her saying, uh, let's not be afraid, girls. You know, we are ready. So it, it's just, uh, she was saying that this in Hindi, but just the fact that, you know, even if it's Australia, whatever it is, we are ready. We are uh, there to give it back to them. Let's not be afraid. So for someone who is 19 years old to have that, you know, sense of temperament and just fearlessness in her game, which is something which India needed. And the second T20I was just how uh, it's the small missing components, which are fitted together, can make this Indian team uh, so powerful. In the third T20I, the middle order did fail and the same issues came to haunt them but um, you know it's just about consistency they've got a new coach now batting coach so uh, exciting times ahead I, I would say that so in that game they got a boundary off the last ball that tied it up we went to the super over India come out they smashed 20 runs in the super over Australia made 16 but they hit a six off the last ball so they were out mm -hmm. of the super over a little bit earlier I've, it was just a good game of T20 cricket exciting game anything that goes to the super over um, what was really interesting then is we talked about the crowd at the ground and certainly that crowd went popping, um, and got very excited, um, and became a big part of it. But I think the more pressing thing for me is the social media side of things. This is a game that really got picked up on social media and that most importantly, casual Indian cricket fans watch. So I don't know how many hardcore Indian cricket fans there are, if you count the men's team, but this went beyond that bubble of just people who are, you know, completely um, in. I don't know if it was your tweet or someone else, but it went beyond uh, 10 million uh, views yeah. uh, on Hotstar. Um, that is, once you get over that sort of number, that we're, we're starting to get to the sort of area where the men's team get to at that point. Now, it's not quite at the same level, uh, you know, they can get up to... Mm -hmm. Well, they can get up to, if it's India, Pakistan, well beyond. But for a normal bilateral game like this, if, if the Indian men get 28, 30 million on Hotstar, um, they're looking pretty good. But for a standard game, you're probably looking at more, what, 15 to 20 million. So over 10 million for the women. And that wasn't, that's not free. And that was all because it was a close game and because the, the, the Indian women came up. That's massive. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um and that's not counting, you know, people who are watching on television. That's just people who have subscribed to Hotstar. So I was watching on television, but I had the Hotstar subscription on, so I whoa, could, whoa, you know, whoa, see whoa. the numbers. So you doubled the numbers. So we can't <laughs> we can't count this. There's all these people out here with two screens. <laughs> Yeah, because the television is, you know, a few deliveries, a few seconds faster. Not a few deliveries, a few seconds faster. Mm. So it helps when I'm walking. Nothing annoys me more. <laughs> That when I, when I have to uh, uh, yeah. when I have to work in cricket, but I'm having to do it on an iPad or a phone, and you can't follow Twitter at the same time, or you can't follow Cricket yeah. or Crick Buzz because they're <laughs> ahead of you. Sorry, yeah. that, that's a completely different rant. But it is so annoying that so many of these streaming platforms, and sometimes it could be like four deliveries. Yeah, like what? Yeah, I didn't want to live four deliveries in the past. Who do you think I am? Continue. I think it was the same match where initially I was watching. Um, I didn't really expect it to go the, you know, become as exciting as it 
stayed eventually and I was watching uh, on my laptop because I had work and it helps in taking screenshots, etc. So I was watching on my laptop, you know, with a mini tab and I was working. Uh, obviously, it was a few deliveries late and the super over, like, in the last over, people were like, oh my God, there's a phone now. And I'm like, don't give spoilers, don't give spoilers. So that was irritating. And then I eventually went and saw it on the television. Uh, so yeah, these numbers, uh, it doesn't count the TV numbers. And uh, by the end, it was around 11, um, 11 lakhs. I don't know how that translates into millions, but it was 11 lakhs. And just a number which is at the top of my mind was, you know, when Rishabh Pant was batting against Sri Lanka uh, this year, early in the year, and he got 100, the uh, people watching then was 7 lakhs on wow. Hotstar. So um, I this is no, like, I'm not comparing. I'm not saying that, you know... People should watch women's cricket more. They shouldn't watch men's cricket or whatever. This is no way of comparison. But I'm just saying that this number is huge because there is this whole talk, even within the BCCI circles, even within the journalists that who are close and privy to the happenings in the BCCI, they are constantly like, you know, the women's IPL is getting delayed because the BCCI fears they won't get in uh, audiences. The BCCI is delaying the women's IPL because they're scared, not scared or whatever word you can use. They, uh, they don't think that people will be interested or no one is going to watch the TV revenues. Like there won't be money coming in or all these excuses, all these ready excuses kept coming up when uh, you kept on talking about, you know, women's IPL and the development of women's cricket. So, and this match, you know, it was... Just one of match, they went on to lose lose the 30 20 I But it just proved that, you know, if marketed well, if the pitch is well, another reason, you know, the pitch was brilliant in, in that game. Actually, the first two games, the pitch was brilliant. So there are a lot of talks about, you know, shortening the uh, pitch and, you know, making the boundary smaller because the women's cricket, it's boring. It doesn't have a lot of um, power and it's like a snooze fest, whatever. But the importance of a good pitch and all these reasons is just like no reason for the BCCI. It, it was a slap for the BCCI, I would say. Like So that was the overall impact for me that, you know, the BCCI was just shut up once and for all. And hopefully the women's IPL is now a greater success. Yeah, I should say when I was talking about those numbers before, I was talking about more the TV numbers. The hot star numbers on their own are just absolutely phenomenal. And yeah. I didn't realize when you were tweeting, you're just talking about the streaming numbers, which is yeah. absolutely off, off the charts. Um, so here's the thing I'm interested about. This is a bilateral. They're giving tickets away. So the BCCI who are running this <laughs> tournament don't particularly think it's going to be massive. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, if, if I was running Indian cricket outside of premium tickets, I'm not sure I'd ever sell tickets. I probably would only ever give tickets away because you can make, you make so little off the ticket sales. Anyway, um, you could almost have or the rest of the world will have empty grounds and Indian cricket could have full grounds everywhere, but that's a, that's a slightly separate, uh, way of looking at things. Um, it's, it's a bilateral game. Uh, I know it was on a weekend. It wasn't particularly, uh, it, it wasn't hugely marketed coming in as in, you know, they were playing Australia, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't like everyone was banging it up. It's a huge deal for a game like this to pop the way that it has being that it is a bilateral game. Uh, was in the middle of a series. India had lost the first game, hadn't they? Yeah. They'd lost the first yep. game. Yeah. Yep. So it's not like India were coming off a great win. It just feels like this is another huge moment for women's cricket um, around the world that a bilateral game, I know it's India involved and India changes everything, but that a bilateral game can pop to such a level that suddenly it becomes, well, let's, it was basically a water cooler game, right? Um, you know, if the next day you were going to be talking about that game, that feels like another, I don't know, another level unlocked for women's cricket. It's easy to do that in a world cup and, you know, but to do it outside of a world cup seems like something else. 
Yeah, and uh, I was just looking at few numbers. There were twenty four thousand people approximately uh, during the World Cup final at Lords in two thousand seventeen. Uh, obviously, eighty six thousand the huge number at MCG, and uh, we spoke about the huge turnout at Eden Gardens in nineteen ninety seven as well. But again, yeah, the, these were all world events, and you know, there's something larger at stake. This is just a you can say a meaningless T20I and mm. plus it's against Australia. It's not even against uh, a team where you are guaranteed a win. So um, it's Australia. And though India have had a history of, you know, running uh, Australia very close, their last three World Cup defe uh, defeats, Australia's, have come at the hands of India in 2017, 2018 and then... Um, in 2020 World Cup, T20 World Cup, then they ran Australia close in the Commonwealth Games, the for uh, the league game, and then even the final. Uh, they could have won the final if not for the whole middle order mess as well. So uh, I think people who follow women's cricket would have known that, okay, this is a team that has a lot of potential. They keep falling at the final hurdle. But then you never know that, you know, this kind of support, what this kind of support does to these players. And uh, even Smriti Mandana, who's played all across the world, she was talking about, you know, how this kind of uh, support just cheers the team on and then makes them do want to do bigger things. So overall, for a bi bilateral, these were unheard of numbers. And even the BCCI would have been shocked just for the fact that, you know, for the last three T20Is, they have started pricing the tickets. So which just shows that, okay, wow, this has gone beyond what we expected and all. So um, huge kudos to the people who actually turned up because... I am very impressed and happy that the BCCI is, you know, has had to take cover uh, once and for all, hopefully. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really interesting. What we are going to do now is I asked you to come up with a list of your five most um, monumental, I, 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 how did I, how did I phrase it to you? The, the most important games in women's, modern women's cricket history. We say modern women's cricket history just because we're not hypercoursed uh, uh john leather if you've never never followed women's cricket hypercoursed on twitter or mastodon now he was banned from twitter recently um but he's back um he's probably the best uh especially from the historic side of of the game of, of following it around the world he's absolutely brilliant neither of us are pretending to be him um and you know he'll suddenly be talking about it jamaica versus you know new zealand one day off from you know 1978 or something but Women's cricket has obviously changed a lot. So in the last, you know, mm -hmm. five to ten years, we're looking at the the most important games in women's cricket. Um, give me your number one. Um, I would still say it's the 2017 World Cup final. Ooh, um, that's not my number one. I've got yeah. that way lower down the order. I would call that my number one because of you know the not only for the match obviously not the final but you know the semis and the final knockouts combined you can say because of the overall impact it had in you know just changing the attitude towards women's cricket maybe because India was there and they lost by nine runs they lost the semi uh, final by nine runs it was a close defeat and you know, it was just very heartbreaking loss. Maybe if, if it had been a 100, 150 run loss, no one would have really cared. But that coming after Harman Preet Kaur's fantastic uh, innings. And, you know, just one more before we get to it. That was the first article which I read of yours. You know, that uh. was the, uh, the Harman Preet Kaur article you wrote. That was the first article I wrote of yours. And now to be speaking about that on your show, it's like, you know... <laughs> Life is amazing. <laughs> yes, you're making me feel very old. So that, so that, I have that as number one game, the Harman Preet game, ahead of the World Cup final, because I don't think you get mm. that World Cup final. Well, I mean, literally, India wouldn't have made the final without Harman yeah. Preet's game. Mm. But also, that Harman Preet game had the exact same curve that that game had um, that we're talking about, this India-Australia game, in that it didn't start out with anyone thinking it was going to be anything special. And then as she takes mm. off... That you could, I remember the ratings go out. There's a really interesting backstory about this. Is that is the day that Crick Info redesigned their site, right? And basically the whole thing crashed because they weren't expecting that many people to turn up for that particular game. 
Um, and uh, no one could work out where the scorecards were because everything changed <laughs> and everyone went ballistic for that particular game. So I still remember, um, you know, working with Cricket Phone and going, I can't believe that they picked World Cup semi-final and then Harman Preet does this. So I have Harman Preet at number one. All right, what have you got at number two as your most important game? Again, I would still have an India match there. Uh just for the overall, you know, the buzz it created and how the world started talking about it. It was the um, recent T20 uh, ODI between India and England with Dipti Sharma with her run out, uh, you know, and that that was the match which. So my my top top five games are more about you know the overall impact and no, but that, uh, but that's, that's, how it called the world. No, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't have yeah. that on there. I I talked about that recently. I think it's a really really important moment for women's mm -hmm. cricket. But I almost I almost detached the the run out then uh, yeah. from the game a little bit. So number two for me, I have West Indies winning in 2016 um, in the World T20 because. It's the first time we really see someone from outside that Australia, England, New Zealand triangle of, uh, you know, come along. And also women's cricket hadn't had a lot of massive underdogs, right, that, that had won. And I don't know, you, you probably know this, but maybe some of the audience won't, but that the, when they first went to the Olympics and they said, we would like cricket to be in the Olympics now, the Olympics said, you've got four women's teams who are any good. Why on earth would we let you in? Go and get your women's game better. The ICC did not go and get the women's game better, by the way. It eventually got better on its own. But West Indies winning from a, from a potential of what that could do when they could go back mm. and say, okay, we, we, now have, we now have about, what would you say, with Bangladesh and Pakistan and the Thai women, um, they probably now have, what, seven, eight, nine teams that are very good. But yeah. that West Indies win on its own is worth a lot politically. So I've got that as number two. All right, what have you got as your number three? I was actually there for the final, 2016 final. Oh. For the women's and the men's games. Yeah, so, it was, yeah it was, that was exciting. It's such a weird day. Like, I wrote this, I remember writing this huge piece about it because it was like this huge celebration of West Indies cricket. And looking back mm -hmm. on it, it kind of feels like that might be the last big celebration yeah. of West Indies cricket that we've ever had, which is which is a real, real shame. Uh, what have you got at number three? Uh, at number three, I'll have Thailand's win against Pakistan in the Asia Cup. Oh, this year. that's good. It's, it was... I feel like I should have had that. <laughs> it was, you know, for everything, it's Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Not as strong as the men's team, but obviously it's Pakistan and then it's Thailand, you know. Uh, so just the overall impact of what it would have done to the women cricketers in Thailand, just overall it's... Uh, plus the fact that a player from Thailand played in the uh, women's T20 Challenge for the last two seasons. So that, you know, overall just uh, mm. heightens the growth of... Uh, Cricket in Thailand. Um, so yeah. that's why it's my number three. I like that. Uh, the other thing I like about that is, the, and the whole Thailand story is, that be, specifically they're not good at men's cricket, right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's a real, that, if I was the ICC, I'd be like, that is brilliant. And we know a similar things happen in Brazil. And even people are talking about similar things hopefully happening in places like Argentina and other places where if we can get growth in some of these nations where it's not just men's, that actually opens up things even more. And because the problem is that with associate cricket, you kind of need like this Namibia golden generation to come along yeah. to, for it to be any good. What you really want is for... At one stage, the men's team to be good and another stage, the women's team to be good. I, I, yeah, Thailand, I, I'm annoyed. I've gone with something slightly different. It'd be interesting to see if this is on your um, on your list. But it, the India um, test against England at Wormsley in 2014. Yeah. And I've gone for this for a couple of reasons. One, it was played at Wormsley. And for those who don't know, Wormsley is Jean-Paul Getty's uh, is it John Paul Getty? Whichever Getty. Oh, there's so many Gettys, right? Mark Getty used to own Crick Info, by the way. One of the Gettys used to own Crick Info. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's John Paul Getty's personal house. And he then put a cricket ground out the back as rich English people are wont to do. Um, a few Maharajas did it back in the day as well. Uh, a couple of Americans have done it of recent times too. But he put this ground out there. It's literally a hobby ground for himself. But when women's cricket was at that middling level, it's like Wormsley kept offering. And it does have professional... It's a brilliant pitch. Oh, sorry. Let me tell you. 
I played a drive on the up against the first class cricketer on this ground where I could have dropped the bat and walked off. I was so happy. Just like the, the way the ball came onto the bat. And it, I was like, this is great. It was, it's maybe my highlight of my career. Um, but it, it's a beautiful pitch. And so they offered it. But this is why I think it was really big. At that stage, early on, there was a lot of talk about how women shouldn't be playing test cricket. Mm. It wasn't entertaining. By the end of the game, it was one of the most feel-good um, stories that, that you will ever see. But also, it sort of, maybe not in the short term, but certainly in the long term, moved women's cricket away from those, what I would say, non-professional grounds. That's a little bit un unfair yeah. to Wormsley because it's a semi-professional ground. But what I mean is in England, there's about 40 grounds above it in the pecking order. So if you're playing, you know, so now we know that England's home has become um, Taunton. Also, the fact that the England women had gone professional in, what, 2012, 2013, I think, off the top of my head. So for them to lose to India at that stage, I think, was really important. That it was a test match and everything else. Um, I just think it was a really big moment for for the continuation of women's cricket because at that point, it's kind of before T20 had completely taken over, but at that point, we really didn't talk about women's test matches at all. Yeah, um, I don't have that on my list, um, but I have the two, um, again, India, you can say I'm favoring India, but then I have the two uh, tests that India played last year on my list. So one was against England and one was against Australia. Both were away, uh, both ended in a draw um, and both were played away from home and especially the one against Australia, you know, India scored 377 for eight declared in their first innings last year. Uh, Australia scored 249, uh, for, 241 for nine declared in their first innings. So, uh, and the match went on and ended in a draw and Mandana was brilliant again in that match. So it was uh, the talks of, you know, how even the one against uh, uh, England, India came back from nowhere and they just had a very brave partnership and they just hung on for a draw and there were talks that, you know, this is why women's test cricket needs to be five days long because there were these two draws which played out and they could have had a result if there was an additional days in both games. So, uh, I didn't have the one 2014 in your list. I wasn't really following cricket back then, so uh, I didn't go way back. All right, we understand uh -huh. you're very young. You don't have to mention it in every answer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, yeah. but have you got those at number four and five, or is that a joint number four? I think I've added that as a joint number. So I had at number four, I had the England uh, uh, England winning the World Cup final in in 2017. Uh, so I had it lower than the Harmon Preet game. I still think it was an important game because I think that uh, what, what did you say the crowd was for before? Was it twenty seven thousand or twenty four thousand? Twenty four thousand. I I remember thinking it was a sellout. Um, like I was there for that particular game, but there was a lot of what I really liked about that game is there was a lot of hype beforehand, uh, and the ECB mm. did a great job. The ECB basically made every player available beforehand. And I remember um, Hen, uh, who was running English women's uh, media at that stage. I think she's moved on to another position of recently. But I remember like calling her up and just going, I'd like to talk to all the players. And I must have said that to every media manager in the world before. And it's the first time anyone would said, okay, uh, how much time do you have? And literally, I just had like this rotation. And I remember... I think it was Colo had someone, maybe Vish, and there were all these journalists in the uh, at the at the um, wasn't the nursery and WG Grace, uh, uh, whatever it's called, the garden, and literally they were just going through and like Mark Robinson would come over, hello Jared, how are you? And you know, very Mark Robinson, and then you know Anya would come by and Heather, and it was and and the, but the whole thing was there was. I don't know, 40 or 50 media around the day before a game. That is just not something you see. And part of that is obviously that it's a final, but I've covered women's finals before. I covered that 2016 final. I covered the 2012 final. There weren't no one there. No, do you know what I mean? It wasn't like this, right? This, yeah. It was a real different day. I think the game was important. I've just put it down below the others um, uh, just because I think that the others might have had different kind of impacts. And I still think the mm. Harmon Preet game was the reason that that other game did. All right, what have you got at number five? And I should say, I, I and I'm asking you first because I have about seven number fives. At number five, again, uh, I would say the 2020 World Cup final. 
just for the huge crowd 86000 it was the first tournament women's Oh, no, 2018 was the first tournament standalone women's T20 World Cup. But this was the first uh, one tournament. that felt really yeah. standalone, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it was, um, you know, to have 86,000 people at the MCG really? watching, um, I don't know what the numbers were for the India-Pakistan game this year. Uh, I think it was it around was, the same, wasn't been, it? Yeah, it would have been pretty close, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, just the buzz, there was Katy Perry performing and... The, uh, obviously i wasn't there but from people who were there they were like you know the whole it it seemed like the whole city was just talking about this final yeah. and um, in contrast if you can compare that to the men's uh, men's t20 world cup there was you know hardly anyone turned up uh, except for uh, the india pakistan game and a few other games and people were like many didn't even know that you know such a final such a tournament was going on so you know just the contrast that within a space of 2 years the women's game attracted such a huge amount of interest and everyone was talking and then just 2 to 2 and a half years later the men's men's uh, tournament the quality of matches were great but you know the overall uh, spectator count was in the greatest so you know just in comparison um, that was one more tournament which showed that okay women's cricket is here and people do want to watch the game so yeah. that's number 5 for me yeah it was one of my number 5s i'm i'm i'll leave it off now that you've put it on I, what i found interesting about that was that the icc went out of their way to mm. promote one game it's a really risky strategy. Imagine, you know, they did that and they got yeah. like 25,000 people there, right? And it didn't work. And this whole thing about Melbourne and loving sport. Melbourne does love sport, but Melbourne also knows when when something's not real. Like, hmm. you know, M Melbourne at one stage had, wow. It, you know, it's had, it's got 150,000 oh, 45,000 seat arena. At one stage it had two arenas that I think both had over 80,000 people, right? But I've been in those arenas when I've been one of seven people, right? I, it's not like everyone turns up for every game. They're there for specific reasons. So it could have gone very poorly. If you look at that and the way that they uh, promoted that, I, I don't know if it was the same team or a different uh, environment, and I know they definitely promoted it in a different way, but there is no doubt that they went out of their way to really sell that one game, um, and they succeeded in it. And then for this last World Cup, they kind of gave away the first week and Australians really got upset at that. And then from then on in, it just never, it never took off in the way that it should have. And in the end, it was the, 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 the tourists who flew in, whether it be for India or Pakistan or England, that really ended up, and Zimbabwe, um, who really ended up giving that tournament life. That's a huge error for me. So yeah, I, I, I had that on my list. I'm going to throw two other games at you. You're talking about the biggest crowds for women's games. I don't know how many people were at this game, but I'm pretty sure that it was a sellout for the first women's 100 game. Uh, that was mm. free tickets as well. It was really interesting. Um, so it was at the Oval, and I think there was around twenty to 22,000 off the top of my head. Uh, it was, I remember it was absolutely jammed in there, um, and it was the first time I'd been in a women's game where we were there to see the women's game where it felt like a party for women's cricket. So 2017 World Cup felt like a, a World Cup event and, and there was a lot of hype around it. But that that first 100 game felt like something else. It's the first time I've really been in a crowd of that size where it just felt like people were there because they loved the thing. Uh, and which is interesting because it was free and there would have been a lot of people who probably hadn't been to a game before. And if I was going to tack on another game on the end of this, I think it's probably also worth pointing out the fair break game, the first fair break game, uh, which was tele a, tele a telecast around the world um, and got... It didn't get as much attention or as much crowd, obviously, as many of these others. But having that tournament, which is something that men have never really managed, which is that international franchise tournament, on top of that, then making it so it helps associate cricket. And then on top of that, making it good enough that there's going to be an, at least one more tournament off, off the back of this as well. For me, it seems like a really, really big deal. So... I think the women's hundred is more important. And if you if you're saying, oh well, the women's big bash was around before it, the women's big bash was really a throw-in to the men's big bash. And I don't know how many people know the full story, but the women's hundred 
got extra push because the sponsors basically wanted it to have extra push. And in the end, it, it, it did end up being a sort of a curtain raiser tournament for the men's hundred. But that first game was standalone and absolutely rocked. I, I, so I thought that was a huge one as well. Is there any, any others? Have you got any honorable mentions or have, have we done every game that we could think of? The next time we speak, hopefully the women's IPL is on my list. <laughs> women's IPL, yeah, it should definitely be on there. Women's PSL was another one. Um, yeah. I actually, I watched some of the women's CPL with my son. Actually, I think I watched some of the women's, what was the other tournament called? The 60 uh, with my son yeah. Yeah. Um, as, as well. In fact, I, I probably said this on the podcast before, but one of my sons did say to me once, Dad, is it okay if we watch the men playing cricket sometime too? And he wasn't saying <laughs> it like, he, he was just like, he was more almost asking the question because we'd been watching so much women's cricket of whether there was any men's cricket to watch as well. Uh, Sarah, uh, thank you very much for coming on. I do think this is an important game um, going ahead. Do you think, uh, does this game, I know you talked about embarrassing the BCCI. Do you think this game will be something that we will look back on in, uh, we haven't put it in our lists. Mm. I don't even know. It's too recency biased for either, either of us to put this in our list. But do you think, looking back, this might be one of those, and I know we've had a lot in women's cricket, but another sort of levelling up situation? Yeah, definitely. I, I I would say so because it's it doesn't only give the BCCI, like, open their eyes to the fact that women's cricket in India is uh, something which the consumers want, but it also, you know... Uh, doesn't let them hide behind any more excuses that, you know, no one is interested or there is no talent pool because uh, this is something which Saru Gangli uh, said a few months ago that, you know, there's no talent pool in Indian cricket. So that's why the women's IPL is being delayed, which is bizarre because obviously the performances of the women's team, you can say, is better than the men's team at world events. So, um all these reasons, the BCCI won't have any other reasons, excuses to hide behind. And hopefully uh, this could be the start of something new. The performances need to keep coming also. We've spoken about that. But whatever performances they are, it's in spite of the BCCI's, you know, uh, terrible attitude towards women's cricket. So just imagine if the attitude is 1% better and there is a serious, uh, you know, eagerness to develop women's cricket, how... Indian women's team and women's cricket in general could just uh, improve. So it's something for the BCCI to uh, consider. I don't think they will because they are just a bunch of old politicians just snacking around, not caring about women's cricket. But I just hope it's the start of something new. And the IPL franchises, hopefully they join women's IPL because that will, you know, already have the established fans mm. uh, go to the women's uh, IPL teams also. And just imagine if KKR is there, I'm going to have two KKR teams to bash out at and lose my temper at. Yes, so, I can't yeah. wait for you to be just as angry about the women's team as you are the men. Just on that talent yeah. pool thing, it, obviously it's nonsense, right? But in a very specific mm. way, it's nonsense. Because when you're saying the talent pool isn't there, what you are actually saying is the BCCI has not developed yeah. the talent correctly, mm. right? And so what they should be saying is now what we're going to do is develop that talent and here's how we're going to do it. Because otherwise what he is saying is for some reason, Indian men are, are born with more talent for cricket than Indian <laughs> women, which makes absolutely no sense at all. But um, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. If, if for those of you who haven't heard um, Nikesh and Sarah, go over to India on 99.94. Or if you're listening to this on India on 99.94, just come over to my podcast and listen to me, Jared Kimber. All right, we'll see you again next time.